Numbers chapter 18 may look complicated, but really it is not so very difficult. The whole chapter is concerned with priests and Levites, with their responsibilities and their rewards, because in God's economy and in God's will and use of his children, rewards go with responsibilities responsibilities with rewards. Now, if you want to see the structure of the chapter right now at the beginning, let me show it to you. It breaks down into four straightforward parts. The first seven verses, the first paragraph, in fact, is concerned with the duties of the Levites. And then it moves on from verse 8 to verse 20, to the rewards of the priests, Aaron and his sons. Then, verses 21 to 24, to the rewards of the Levites. And when we come to these two things, the rewards of the priests and the rewards of the Levites, we'll take them almost together. And then lastly, the chapter closes from verse 25 to the end, speaking as it does about the tithe of the priests, the tithe that is given by the Levites to the priests. And we'll take them in order because we can't improve on the sense of the scriptures themselves, not that we would try. Dealing firstly then with the duties of the Levites, the first seven verses. Now, <clears throat> there's a very clear connection between chapters 16 and 17 and chapter 18. <clears throat> the connection is made at the end of chapter 17 in these verses which are strange without that which follows. Verses 12 and 13 of chapter 17, as you can see, read, The people of Israel said to Moses, Behold, we perish, we are all undone. Everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Are we all to die? And so, begins verse uh, chapter 18, so, in other words, in response to this, the Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons, you are the ones who will come near, not even the Levites, so that you and the Levites and the people shall live and not die. That's the connection of thought. That's the connection of purpose with what goes before. Now, chapter 16 and 17, as you'll know if you've been following these studies in the evening services, are concerned with vindicating Aaron and vindicating his priesthood in the face of a challenge. We want to be priests too, said the rest of the Levites. No, said God, I haven't called you to that office. Now, chapter 16 is a negative vindication of Aaron. Chapter 17 is a positive vindication of Aaron. You know, the rod that blossomed and budded and fruited. And chapter 18 continues by pointing out the dangers of despising that which is holy and trying to take to yourself something that does not belong to you because the Lord has not called you to it. Chapters 16 and 17 are concerned with high-handed sin, presumptuous sin, as we have it in the book of Numbers. Chapter 16 is an example of that high-handed sin of rebellion against God. Now in chapter 18 we have a corrective. In chapter 18, we have a guide, a very firm guide as to the way out of this presumptuous sin and a way to avoid it in future. The Lord God is concerned that his people will not continue to fall into high-handed sin. And so he gives them a clear definition of the office and work of their priests, of the office and work of their Levites, and tells them why these ministries are to be distinct. Chapter 18 clearly states the responsibilities and the duties of the priest and of the Levite, and also points out the awful implications 
of failure to carry out these responsibilities and duties. Now what has that got to do with us? I mean, by a little bit of stretch of our imaginations, we can see how that might apply to ministers of the gospel. But how does it apply to every one of us, to every Christian? Does it have something to say to us all? Yes, it does, as I hope you'll see. So then, we have a connection. A connection between chapter 18 and all that it says the opening verses in particular, and the closing verses of chapter 17. What we have here is God continuing to deal with the challenge made by the rebels against Moses' leadership on the one hand and Aaron's priesthood on the other. Here is God continuing to answer those who wanted a position that didn't belong to them, who wanted the kudos, the recognition, who wanted what they might have foolishly and falsely seen as the glamour of standing up at the front. This chapter says, oh no, that is not for everyone. That is only for those whom God calls. And so here the priesthood is described in terms that make it perfectly clear that it is not a position to be desired for itself. Therefore, it is never a position to be coveted. This is coupled to a warning against wanting such a position for the wrong reasons, for carnal reasons, selfish, fleshly, personal reasons. A call to minister to the people of God at any time and in any form is a call. It is not for volunteers. It is for conscripts. All right, obedient conscripts. But very often, you know, with good motives, people can volunteer where God is not calling them. Now, this is a recurring theme in the Bible. It is a strand of teaching that's woven through the Bible in a, as a history of God's dealings with his people. The warning, that is, not to hanker after positions of what seems like spiritual authority, but is not really spiritual authority, except that it is under God and because of his call. Now, there are many examples of, of this in the scriptures but listen to these words do you seek great things for yourself says the Lord seek them not now do you remember who received these words from God it was Jeremiah's assistant Baruch Baruch wanted a particular ministry for himself. He had a ministry, but he wanted something, it would appear, more similar to Jeremiah, Jeremiah's than what he had. And God takes up Baruch's words in Jeremiah 45 and throws them back to him and says, Now, Baruch, do not seek this for yourself. Seeking great things is not denied or outlawed, but seeking them for yourself is. Do you seek great things for yourself, says God? Seek them not. Now, that is in essence what the Scripture teaches about the call of God to particular service and especially to everything that comes under the heading of priesthood or ministry. The book of Hebrews, and this is a very important passage for Numbers chapter 18. The book of Hebrews chapter 5, if you want to turn this up, do so very quickly. This is important. Here, the big middle section of the book of Hebrews, which is concerned with the priesthood of Christ, which is a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, begins. But it begins with a warning. 
Every high priest, Hebrews 5 and 1 says, chosen, look at it, chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weaknesses. And that, of course, will lead him to some great things he has to say about the ministry and priesthood of Jesus, the great mediator. But here comes a general principle. Because of this, he is bound to offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as those of the people. And one does not take the honor upon himself. But he is called by God just as Aaron was. Now it's as if the writer to the Hebrews is laying hold upon Numbers 18 and setting it down for us in the church of Jesus as a principle for the call to ministry. No one takes this honor upon himself. He is called by God. That is the essence of what is being said here. That is something that underlies the teaching of the New Testament about the church itself. You know where Paul, for example, in 1 Corinthians 12 and 12, speaks about the church as the body of Christ. He points out that we all have different functions and that those who appear to be least important are most valued and treasured by God but that each has his own office and there is to be no jealousy and no seeking after something that is not ours and not our calling. God to Aaron, God to Baruch, God to us in the book of Hebrews is saying the same thing. We are not to trespass on another person's calling, a calling that is not ours. And we are being urged to be content with that to which God has called us. And God has a call for every believer. He asks us to be happy, to be content with that to which we are called, and to get on with it, and to do it with all our hearts. And you know, in the New Testament, even marriage, or not being married, is described in terms of a call of God. That's your status. As far as that relationship is concerned, get on with it and enjoy your calling. Be what God calls you to be. Do that which God lays to your hand. And don't keep looking over your shoulder to your brother and want to be like him or doing what he or she is doing. Coveting another person's place or envying another person's task is not just wrong. It's actually very foolish. And those of us who have done it and been drawn up by God and made to face the foolishness know something of just how foolish that foolishness is. It just makes us unhappy. There is a gentle but if gentle, clear and firm reminder here to God's people at all times and in all places that every call of God has responsibilities and a reminder also that the call to a priestly office, a work of intercession, a work of ministry, has a particular, not necessarily a greater, but a particular kind of costliness. Therefore it has to be those who are consecrated by a call of God who operate in that office. And if there's intrusion, or if there's profane things in the church of God, or if there are profane persons intruding into the things of God, into the sanctuary of God, then it's the responsibility of those called, of the Levites here, to prevent that from happening. They are responsible to God. Here God speaks to all who are called to this kind of task. Here God speaks to all who are called to a spiritual office within the church. The servant of God is responsible for seeing that the church is not defiled by intrusion 
of profane things. Just as the Levites had the task of seeing to that no one else brought anything foreign into the tent of meeting, so it is our responsibility not to close down the house of God, but to guard it. And the one who is called to this is responsible also for the work of ministry. He is accountable to God. It's for this and for other reasons, but for this reason also, that it says in the New Testament that we ought not to seek this thing. Let not many of you, says James, become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach shall be judged with greater strictness. And for this reason, ministers today or in any other day cannot allow themselves to be pushed into wrong practices. Must not allow themselves to be pushed into things which profane the church just because the minister fears to be unpopular or because he cannot stand conflict. I tell you in this light, I yet do not understand why it is although there must be a very good reason that the Lord chooses to call so many very sensitive people into the ministry. Because it's clear that ministry will involve conflict. That the true servant of God must be prepared for costly consecration and that may mean being at odds with others even being at odds with large sections of people, rather than be at odds with God. Now, this is no mandate for being a disagreeable person. And it's no mandate for servants of God to be hasty and foolish as many of us are. And in doing so, we sometimes bring the whole work of the evangelical ministry into disrepute. It is no mandate for being a disagreeable, objectionable, obstructive person. But neither is, a, is it a mandate for being weak and ineffective. There are, because there have to be times when faithful leadership and faithful ministry is not popular. Think of John 6 and 66, when those who followed Jesus decided that it was getting too hard to understand and to obey this man. And so they abandoned him. Now Jesus calls us to the same. And part of the cost of faithfulness within the church for those called to the ministry can be a matter of unpopularity in some quarters. But faithfulness to God is the responsibility of the servant of God as it was for the Levites, as it was for the priests. So it is today. John Knox is quoted over and over again as saying something like this. I say like this because I can never find where he said it originally. But he did, obviously, something like this. Any man who fears a man more than he fears God is not fit to enter a pulpit. And it's certainly true that at his burial, the regent Morton said of Knox, Here lieth one who never feared the face of man. I think it's telling that even today Knox is presented in a distorted and untrue light by those who see him as a ranting bully persecuting a poor wee lassie on the throne of Scotland. What a distortion. His unpopularity goes on today. But here lieth a man who never feared the face of man. He fulfilled his own conditions of ministry. Now all of this of course applies firstly and most 
clearly to those who are called to ministry. But isn't there such a thing as the priesthood of all believers? Of course there is. And we are all called in a particular sense to be ministers of Christ to others. Now that's a different thing from what we are calling today the ministry of all God's people. That, I'm not sure, is a very worthy thing. Not the way we are receiving it now. But there is such a thing of the, as the ministry of all believers, the priesthood of all believers. And we are all called to see to it that the church, because we are the church, is obedient and consecrated to God. And like Knox, that means that we must first be obedient and consecrated ourselves. Now the rewards, verses 8 to 20. We said at the beginning that responsibilities were never given without rewards. Now why is it that we want to be altruistic as Christians? That's not a Christian quality, being altruistic, doing nothing, unless you can do it being absolutely sure that you're not doing it for reward. That's just unrealistic and sub-Christian. There is a reward. It is when we seek the wrong reward that it becomes sin. I think I gave you the example some weeks ago now of a man who marries a woman for her money. That's wrong. But it's not wrong to marry the woman for love. You see, reward can be right. And God does not call us to responsibility without reward. I think it's just too pious and falsely holy to say otherwise. It also presents God in a very bad light. Does he not delight in us? And does he not seek to give us joy in his service for all that it might be costly? Jesus speaks of blessings in his service with persecutions, but blessings nonetheless. The Levites and the priests were called to a consecrated office that cost them, but they were provided for. Now we've already seen the, 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 uh, Le the Levites in chapter 6, 7, 8 and into 9 as well of, of this book. You find them in the book of Leviticus, uh, this very thing being dealt with there, their reward and the priest's reward. You find it in Exodus chapters 22 and 23. It goes right throughout the Old Testament. But here we find its significance. The covenant with the priests and the Levites was a firm and a binding and a lasting one. That is the meaning of verse 19, the covenant of salt. It has to do with the fact that like the Levites, the priests had no personal or material possessions or inheritance within Israel, but they had their reward in God. So let's take it with the next section, verses 21 to 24, the reward of the Levites. Now the giving of everything in Israel to the Levites might seem to be something new, but it's not really. The tithes or the tenths given in worship are not new at all. The giving of a tithe in worship was older than Sinai. The giving of the tithe in worship was older than Moses. Centuries older we find in Genesis chapter 14 that Abraham, after his battle with the kings of Chedorlaoma, remember after Chedorlaoma came and he bowed before Melchizedek, this strange priestly king, and offered to him in worship a tenth. 
You need to read the book of Hebrews to discover again what all that means. But what it means for us here tonight is that the whole is in the part. That everything is in the tithe for God's work. That which was given to the Levites was given both as a reward for obedience and as a recompense for his unique place, his disinherited place within the people of God. This was his inheritance in God. And the point is this, that God is no man's debtor. God graciously supplies and meets the needs of all those who serve him. And those who love God and are faithful to him find him to be faithful to. It was a message given to the old priest of God, Eli, wasn't it? Those who honor me, says the Lord, I will honor. 1 Samuel chapter 2. The Lord himself then was the inheritance of the Levites. Therefore they were separated to him in a unique way that showed that all the people were separated to God. In the Levite separation, the whole nation was separated in heart to God and this is the point of all these passages which are concerned with the inheritance of the priests and the Levites and their tithes that the tithes and the provisions made for them so that God's servants should be disentangled from the distractions of life is something that goes on Paul writing to Timothy says that no soldier in service should get entrammeled or entangled in worldly things. So it is that no minister of the gospel, young Timothy, he says, should be distracted. And these things were there so that there should not be distraction. Now from the natural point of view, this is sacrificial living. And it points to the principle that the Christian who is not prepared to count all things loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. The Christian who is not prepared to count everything as devoted to God. Not just the tithe, but the whole devoted to God. That Christian is not likely to be faithful and a faithful Christian is not very likely to be fruitful in God's service. And yet, and yet God's supply is generous to the point of being bountiful. The material provision for the needs of the priests and the Levites points to the spiritual provision of God for their blessing. It points to the blessing that follows for all of us who are prepared to give costly service to God. For all of us who are prepared to give consecrated separation in our lives to God we do not lose God will not be in debt to us when we give ourselves to him for service Paul lays hold upon this very business of the service of the temple to point out that lesson he says in 1 Corinthians 9 don't you know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. In the same way, he says, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. God's not going to be in your debt, says Paul. And the words of Jesus These wonderful words that point us to the generosity of God. We find them in Mark chapter 10. 
And remember, we are thinking about the fact that God is no man's debtor. And if we give ourselves to his service, we will not be, he will not be in our debt. Remember Peter saying to Jesus, Listen, Jesus, we have left everything to follow you. And what did Jesus say? Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions but many that are first will be last and the, and the last first Jesus is saying in a particular way to our discipleship God is not your debtor he is not in debt to you when you give yourself to him you will be richly rewarded in his grace. With persecutions, yes. But God owes you nothing. There is a call here for us to offer ourselves in service, knowing, as Jesus tells us, we must know. He tells two parables to that effect that we must know what the cost is. Knowing the cost, but knowing also that God will not be in our debt. It's we who are in his. And that brings us lastly to the tithe of the priest, verses 25 to 32. It was from the tithe given to the Levites that a further tithe was to be passed on, given to the priests. Now, what are you to make of this? Well, let's turn to the basic principle that underlies this particular command. Now, the principle is this, that Israel's material well-being what we today call the economy. I'm not sure what the economy is, but it's in the news all the time, so there must be something called the economy. Israel's economy. Therefore, the economy of the people of God depends entirely upon the tithe. It depended entirely upon the tithe being given gladly, freely, and wholeheartedly to God. When the people of God responded to his great generosity by bringing back a thank offering, they had very few problems. That was how it worked. Israel was not intended to have a king who would tax them, although she demanded it. Israel was not intended to have a secular government, although she ended up with it. But God was meant to be the king of Israel. And the tithe given to God was a part which symbolized the giving of the whole. Now the same thing follows when you think of the Sabbath rest. The Sabbath rest given to the worship of God was an indication of the giving of the whole life to God and of the great Sabbath rest which was to come. So the tithe indicated that the whole of life and the whole of life's substance was dedicated, devoted to God. Now that's why when we bring our offering in church, I so often use the language of giving ourselves in the giving of a part. That's why it is an offering and not a collection. A collection is something that is taken from us. 
An offering is something we give freely and by choice. The offering of the tithe was an indication that the other nine-tenths as well belong to God. And when we give our offerings to God in Christ, we are doing the same. And if you're asking me if I believe in tithing, well, yes, I do. But I don't believe in the tyranny of demanding tithes. Tithes are offered as all things are offered to God as part of the giving of the whole, or they're not given in a proper spirit at all. The spiritual poverty of the churches in Scotland today is a symptom of something far deeper. Put it this way, put it the other way around. The material struggles that are now facing us in the Church of Scotland, and you'll hear this in a couple of months' time when General Assembly comes round again. The poor giving materially today is a symptom of something deeper too. A spiritual poverty. Never be proud of the fact that you're the highest givers in presbytery. You're not, actually, so you don't need to be proud of it. But someone once came to my last pulpit and did a silly thing and told the congregation that they were the highest givers. I'd kept it from them because it was totally irrelevant. And it just caused those who didn't give very generously to be very proud of themselves. That's meaningless, because the giving of God's people in these days is appallingly short of the giving of gratitude. This is not about offerings. It's about the giving of ourselves. We find this very clearly in the last book of the Old Testament. Will man rob God? Malachi 3 and 8. Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me, says God. And you say, how are we robbing you? In your tithes and your offerings. Bring the full tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. Bring, notice the word, the full tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Put me to the test, says the Lord, that I will not pour down overflowing blessing upon you. Now, if we want to know the blessing of God in these days, it will come when God's people give themselves to him. What is it Paul says about the Macedonians who gave? He says that they gave out of poverty. But he says something more important. He says they first of all gave themselves the whole in the tithe. You know, it's coming today to the position where small independent Christian groups have a disproportionate influence and strength. And do you know why it is? It's because few though they be, they tend to have more people who are generously involved in giving themselves as well as their substance to God because they fully know and love Christ personally. And it's as simple as that. And we are coming to a day where it's going to be small groups who have most influence in the land. The day is coming. And there is no reason in the world why you and I together in the West should not be part of that. The point is this, that consecrated living 
that being separated and devoted to God, that sacrificial Christianity, cross-bearing Christianity as we've called it, and I don't think there is any others, is something to which we are called, and we are called to it cheerfully and gladly. To live for Christ is to live a life consecrated. A life that knows the cost but refuses to count it an obstacle. That refuses to budget God in. But budgets everything else in after him in his first place. And the church that is like that is the church that will see the windows of heaven open and blessing pour down. And I'm cheerfully calling you to that tonight. To live for Christ. No, I'm not speaking about offerings. I'm speaking about the offering of our hearts. To give of everything that we are. Because he has given everything he is for us. There are those of you here tonight, I know, who believe that God is going to bless us. Here is how it will happen. It will happen when we bless the name of God and give ourselves to him. And when we do so, God will owe us everything. No, he won't. (laughs) No, he won't. He will never be in our debt. He will. He is that kind of generous Father. Amen. Let's sing a hymn that is not sung because of its refrain. Because we're not all in the men's guild, which as you know came before the women's guild, founded by the same man, Mr. Charteris. But let's omit the refrain and sing this great hymn without the last two verses of every verse. So we sing him 521 to the tune Petersham, but we miss out the last two lines of every verse.